Ah! <laughs> Greetings, friend. Greetings. Now, are you in desperate or dire need of comic book and pop culture related content? If so, you come to the right place, yes? Because Simple Man's Comics got everything you need. Everything you could ever desire. All the comic book stuff, all the pop culture stuff right here in this blessed YouTube channel. Yes, 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 yes. You've come to the right place. Yes, you have. Simple Man's Comics. It's for you. It's for you. Welcome everyone to the Bolo Show, where we discuss the hottest comic releases of the week. I'm your host, Brian Wood. With me as always is my co-host, Jack DeMeo, aka Mr. Bolo, and you are watching the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel, the one source for all things comic book and pop culture related. So if you haven't done so already, Hulk smash that thumbs up button, hit the subscribe, and ring that bell notification to be notified whenever future videos are released. Jack, how you feeling tonight? Well, I got to tell you, Brian, I'm kind of wore out. It's been a long two weeks set up as a vendor on the convention scene. I don't know how these full-time dealers do it, but I'm getting that shot in the arm right now. I'm ready to go because it's Bolo Show time, baby. My favorite time of the week where we are here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel talking new comic book day releases, what is hot, what is moving, what is buzzing on social media, and what you all out in the YouTube comic community, IG comic community, and all over social media are talking about and excited to pick up off the shelves yesterday and what you're buying on eBay and selling on eBay today. So we do want to take this moment to remind you that this is available in an audio version on the CBSI Comic Book Bolo podcast. It's available audio through iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. In addition to that, it is important to remind you that this show is sponsored from Nick Dortman at Slabbed Heroes. If you're looking for modern guarantee 9.8s at a great price, make sure you check out slabbedheroes.com as well as new modern raw comics, which what we announced last week, we'll bring it up on the screen here from Nick Dortman, our sponsor. He offered up this absolute carnage set here, and we are about to announce the winner in order to enter this contest last week. You did have to comment on the video. And what did they have to comment, Jack? They had to just let us know, what's your favorite symbiote? There's so many out there. Opinions varied. It was real fun to read those comments. But we chose a random one, and we have a winner. Right. So the winner of the variant set you see on the screen right now is Ryan Atkins. His favorite was Scream. We've all had those stage five clinger type girlfriend once in our life. Imagine your worst, then give her a symbiote, which cranks things up to 9,000. So much crazy potential. We're not talking throwing keys and stalking you at Starbucks, but a cold-blooded killer. So yeah, Scream. Great comment. Ryan Atkins, congratulations on winning this. Please email me your address at simplemanscomics at gmail.com. Timely pick, too, as well, Brian, because I think we're going to be talking a little screen tonight. Exactly. So, before we get into the bolo list this week, we will do a rewind from last week's list. And coming up first for the rewind this week, we're going to talk about House of X number two. Right, Jack? Yes, absolutely. A serious mover on the secondary market. Cover A is up to $20. Last week, I think we were uh, focused on that uh, flower variant with a uh, storm on it. Um, you know, it was a, well, a hot 10 honorable mention on Ben Stein's uh, CBSI hot 10 comics list. Uh, we talked about it on the hot 10 comics show right here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. But uh, that cover A is the one that seems to be making major waves on the secondary market. $20 sales left and right. Dealers got their restocks and blew them out quickly. So this one seems, uh, seems to have some heat behind it, uh, looking like a, about a half the print run of, of the first issue which is pretty typical um uh, when you know new series get released so uh, no surprise this is reader buzz driven exactly jonathan hickman's writing a fantastic story so far and there's no doubt a lot of heat on these going on you're hearing a lot of people talking about them i'm not even an x-men fan and i've been picking these up 
Another book we wanted to talk about for the rewind from last week is another big Marvel title, and that was Absolute Carnage number one, right, Jack? Right. Tons of variants. Happy to give some away right here on the Bolo Show. But uh, I talked about cover A being really my long-term play, being that I really think that this is going to be like this generation's seminal like crossover miniseries. Maximum Carnage was huge in the 90s. Um, you know, it, the symbiotes are red hot. We talk about on the Hot and Cold show. They're all over the CBSI Hot 10. Um, the premiere uh, party variant, the two-per-store variant, that was the one we talked about on the Hot 10 show. Um the, that one in 200 all red cover that you see on the screen. If you haven't seen any of those get remarked yet, they look absolutely incredible. Um, so there's just so many different books. Uh, it's kind of pick your poison with this one, but here's the reason why I like it, Brian. What an amazing read Donny Cates delivered 60 pages of awesomeness, three chapters. Um, he worked in some fun little Easter egg stuff, he even kind of homage the watchman in there. Um, uh, you know, just brought in some of our favorite characters from the Venom series, teased that Red Goblin, uh, Normie Osborne versus Dylan Brock thing that we're all waiting for, especially us speculators who are heavily invested in Red Goblin. Um, the Young Guns cover is the one that has a lot of people talking. Uh, you know, that could be long-term spec play. A lot of people are interested in that cover. And now, this week, we're getting more news. We got a little Willy Wonka going on, don't we, Brian? <laughs> yeah, the golden ticket. Right. 20 sketches in the back of cover A. Um, and this is why it pays to read your comics, people. Because uh, if you bought these books and you just flipped them, you might have flipped a 1 out of 20 sketch by Mark Bagley, uh, who is obviously synonymous with Venom and, uh, you know, those early like, Lethal Protector, those early Venom runs. Uh 20 sketches we've seen, uh, three or four of them have hit the market already that I've seen on social media. And, uh, you know, we've seen Spider-Man sketches, Venom sketches. It'll really be interesting to see what these really end up commanding on the secondary market. But man, how cool would that feel, Brian? If you opened up that book, you're reading it and you get to the last page and your jaw just drops and you're looking at an original Bagley sketch sitting right there, numbered out of 20. I can't even imagine yeah, I wonder if you first look at it before the news broke, if you're kind of looking at it, if it's enough to where you could tell this is a legit sketch or if you were just like, oh, that's kind of cool. They did a sketch at the end because you haven't seen any of the other books, right? And you're just thinking that's right. in every book. But, would you keep this or sell this if you pulled one of those? You know what? I would actually keep it just because of being a fan of Mark Bagley and his art. It's kind of a one of a kind. Um, great book. Like you said, this was your long-term play last week, correct? Right. So, Honestly, though, I, I think I would sell it, and I'll tell you why. It's on the back cover, or it's on the back inside cover. It's t tough display, you know? Yeah. Otherwise, it's just a book in your long box. Yeah. But it'll be interesting to see what these end up going for on the secondary market. Uh, I really don't even know how to predict this one. So, and, and At the same point, I could see keeping it like you were saying, because it's just one of those things where when are you going to have that opportunity again to pull something so random? It reminds me of sports cards. It's pulling that you know real rare sports card out of a pack. You can make a lot of money selling the card, but you're not going to get that memory and experience back of ripping that pack open and seeing that rare one of one gem, or in this case, one out of 20. Um, very cool. I hope they do more of this in the future. Yes. It is a great story. And I was, you know, Donnie Cates, he reminds me of like um, that cool kid at the bus stop who, who made it. You know, everyone's cheering for him because you can tell he's passionate about everything he does. Huge comic book fan. I'm not saying a lot of these other authors aren't, but Donnie Cates ha carries that gravitas with him. Feels like you can relate to him. Does an amazing job writing all these stories. So you also get that kind of, you root for him and you enjoy the stories that you're picking up. And it seems like everything he writes is like the Midas touch for sure. But I enjoyed Absolute Carnage. Can't wait for the next one. And we got tie-ins this week that we're going to talk about during this list, correct? Right, absolutely. And I think that the heat from this book is going to transfer long-term into all of these tie-ins. I think the people putting together these master sets are going to be the ones who are going to be able to kind of Dan Piercy style, put those sets together, make that money in the long term. I'll also tell you, for all that talk about print run and availability of cover A, again, I talked about this in the intro. I was set up at a comic convention this weekend. I was the only one in the building with Absolute Carnage covers, and I was selling them for just under two times cover because a lot of people forget that not everywhere in the country – I live in South Carolina. Not everywhere in the country can you 
can do stores order heavily on books like this, especially $8 cover price books. So I had tons of people coming up to my booth all weekend saying, you know, do you have Absolute Carnage? I don't have a copy yet. So it was it was an easy sell for me, um, and I, I wrote about it again, comicbookinvest.com. Check out the Bolo article there, the back issue Bolo section. Uh, I wrote about some of the hot Marvel reader buzz number ones. And let us know, would you like to see the back issue Bolo section turned into a video right here on Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel? It's an idea I've been kicking around. Um, would like to let you guys out there, Simpleman's Comics family, let me know if that's something you'd like to see. I got the green screen up right here. We can make that happen. Definitely. And that's going to wrap up our rewind for the Bolo list from last week. So we're going to bring it right now up to this week's list. And as always, if this is your first time watching this or have no idea what the Bolo list, first of all, Bolo stands for Be On The Lookout. This week, Jack got this list out super early. A lot of people were pumped for it. But we cover the first appearances, the reader buzz, and variant buzz for all the new releases of the week. Absolutely. And if, and if at all you see a, you, there's a first appearance out there that you're upset wasn't on the list, that's the give and take of getting the list out early. I know you guys want that list out Tuesday night. I'm happy to do it for you. The only caveat to that is sometimes we're going to miss some of those spoilers that you know we weren't able to get previews or retailer lookouts or things like that. So you know we, we, can only, we only want to list confirmed ones. There was uh, a lot, actually a lot of talk in the market. Um, I almost got caught up. I had another first appearance on the list for about five minutes that I had to pull off that, uh, that that's what you pay for when you don't double check your sources. But so, you know, you got to watch out for that kind of stuff. But, you know, we're, we're going to work to get that list out Tuesday night. We know that's what you guys want. You guys want that list going into your LCS first thing on Wednesday morning. And we're going to try to deliver that to you. Right. And we also want to take this moment to let you know that we, this is a premiere video tonight that we are not live. We are in the live chat with you guys, so we're in the conversation. want to appreciate everyone that's watching this that's in the chat right now, but we are going to move right into the first appearances for the week. And we just had one on the list this week, and we are talking about Absolute Carnage Scream number one, correct? Right, and here you have the first appearance of Patricia Robertson, who was formerly She-Venom. Um, she was, I believe, the second She Venom, um, now as Scream. Um, and as we talked about with the uh, contest from last week, Scream is obviously a, a real interesting character with a history and backstory um, with Venom. And uh, now we get this one shot. It's also been announced there's going to be a new Scream series coming post Absolute Carnage. So I, I think that there's some spec value here. Originally, my view of this book was this book is good for what we talked about earlier, sets. You buy this book, and really my focus was grab cover A. I know some people have been looking at some of these variants, but my thought was grab cover A, put it with your Absolute Carnage sets, start stacking those sets up and get ready for when Absolute Carnage is over. And people are scrambling to put those sets together because some of the books are going to be lower printed than others. You know, Absolute Carnage number one will definitely have a high print run. But some of these crossovers won't because it, not every store is going to jump on board. Having said that, now that we know that there is going to be a Scream series, whether it's a mini or ongoing, I'm not exactly sure. But the bottom line is we talk about this all the time. You guys hear me say these same things week in and week out. And I know this show is growing. So some of you guys may not. Um, you may be watching this for the first time. So I always want to kind of go back and, and hammer home on these points. But follow the money. If Marvel's putting enough money into this character that they're going to go ahead and invest in another series with this character, it's not just some one-off thing just for Donny Cates' story. I think that these first appearances may be ones you want to jump on board of. And again, we're talking cover price. Cover price for cover A. This book isn't going you know, above cover yet. So at this point, you still have a window to grab this book, get it on the ground floor. And uh, take the ride. Look, we, we make a lot of stupid investments. We all do. Um, but a first appearance of a symbiote character uh, with an absolute carnage tie-in, I think that's a, a pretty worthy risk. And I'm not saying go out there and buy 20, 40 copies, but you know, grab a couple copies if you see them, stick them, stick them in a short box and see how you do with it. Did you have a favorite cover out of them? Um, I kind of like that bottom right cover. I think uh, that that's the one that kind of stands out to me. I'm not a big fan of the white cover so much. That's the Dodderman Young Guns, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I like that one. Um, 
and that's just really cover art, not necessarily, uh, you know, it's not the high ratio type. So it's not one that you maybe you look for for speculation play. Um, but and, and again, I think the, the ratio variants are going for like at ratio or slightly below at this point. Like Brian said, we're recording this Wednesday night, release day night. So they, that may change by tomorrow. But there's value there for the variants, without a doubt. Um, I've really kind of become a cover A. It's the got kind of guy, low buy-in. Um, the ROI is amazing on cover A's if a book pops. But, um, you know, I know a lot of people like to play that variant game, that incentive game more. So, you know, to each his own. Right. So that's going to cover the first appearance section on the Bolo list this week. And we're going to go right into the Reader Buzz section. So we're going to kick the Reader Buzz section off with a new book from Image. This was actually part of a two-issue miniseries written by Chip Zdarsky, Chris Anka on art. And we're talking about White Trees number one. Now, this is one that I think went under a lot of people's radars, Brian. I, I didn't hear a lot of people talking about this until like the last second. And I think it was as people were kind of perusing like those sale lists, like Midtown's, um, you know, new release list, My Comic Shop. They were starting to see, wait a minute, sadarsky has got a new book out? I mean, you're talking about a guy who, Daredevil's hot. Um, his run on that Spider-Man life story, I think that caught a lot of people off guard. People weren't really expecting much out of that. They, there's been some spec value in that series, and it's just been a fun story. And, of course, everyone knows Sex Criminals and you know his success there. So I think that at this point, Zdarsky may be like that next up guy. I mean, I, I almost want to make a Donny Cates comparison, but that's a little dangerous. But Zdarsky's on fire, and I think he's going to get more and more work from Marvel. And this is him jumping back into Image, you know, and doing another um, independent comic release. But you and I were literally just talking about this book right before we went on the air here. And we were talking about how, you know, it's a two-issue miniseries. So that turns a lot of speculators off. I said, you know, they can stretch a movie out of two issues. They can, you know, they can, but you ain't getting a TV show. So it's limited to that factor. And then, you know, with the art and the style, it may be more of an animated, I don't know. And we live in the age of options, so that's kind of where it's at. But, Brian, you read this book. What did you think of issue number one? Right. Well, first I'll say we've seen miniseries get turned into ongoings before. I don't know if this two-issue miniseries will be turned into that. But I enjoyed the first issue. I see. I kind of see it's got to be really accelerated to end it in the second issue. But this was great. Uh, three warriors kind of passed their primer, have moved on. One's become a farmer. King calls them in and come to find out that their children have been taken. So they, one's just like, screw it, I'm not going to care about my kid. And the other two are like, no, you got to help us get them. So they go after the kids. And then it kind of turns into um, a really weird, I almost want to say Midsummer's Night Dream type thing where next thing you know, if you thought, someone mentioned it before, I think on Facebook, if you thought Batman Damned number one had some wow factor to it, this will definitely, this kind of mixes you with the, some faithless type stuff art in there. But I enjoyed the first issue. I Like I said, I think the second issue is going to be have to be accelerated or to be continued and then come back with, you know, follow-on miniseries. But great book. Like you said, I'm enjoying Chip Zdarsky right now with what he's writing. And the art in it by Chris Anka, I really enjoyed as well. I don't think there's going to be a huge print run on this one. A little cursory search at eBay. You don't see a lot of copies listed, and you don't see a lot selling. But I just think that this is one that went under people's radar. It may be one, you know, hey, I'm willing to take a risk on Chip Zdarsky. I'm willing to see where that goes. Uh, you know, and we all know how well image releases can do. Um, so, you know, the game is to buy low, sell high. So, you know, I'm willing to take that risk. I think Zdarsky has that Midas touch at this point. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned you know, the Batman damned comparison, like Zdarsky's Mr. Sex Criminal. So <laughs> I don't put, you know, I don't put anything past him. Uh, and let me tell you something. If you ever get the chance to meet him at a convention, what a funny guy he is in person. I mean, yes. he's a real personable, funny guy. Um, you know, it just, he'll talk to you about comics. He's one of those people, the way you mentioned Donny Cates, like you can just tell, like he loves it. And that, and once you meet him, there's some people you meet in the industry you meet them and you're like, I don't really like this guy. Uh, and then it makes you kind of change your opinion about their work. And then there's some people you meet and you're like, oh my God, this guy or girl is awesome. And suddenly you become even more of a fan. Chip Zdarsky is, is one of those types. Right. And a lot of those type people, it seems to be like they're fans themselves. Like, yeah, they realize yes. that they're writing these books, but they treat themselves as a fan of the book. So they almost, you almost feel like 
you're talking to a friend rather than a writer of the book and you're sharing your comic book stories but great book definitely if you like fantasy type stories this is one that you definitely want to pick up and then the next book on the reader buzz section we are talking about absolute carnage tie-ins we talked about scream already so this one we have absolute carnage separation anxiety all right so you're getting a follow-up to the kind of original separation anxiety um which you know was a popular venom miniseries um yeah and again i'm, I'm gonna be brief with this because i'll, I'll end up repeat myself but i think the value here i don't know that there's a ton of spec value individually within the book i think the value comes more from the fact that it's an absolute carnage direct tie-in um you know it's not like one of these books where you know there was the absolute carnage say like the you know the entrails and the trade dress type deal this is a direct tie-in to the story there is some huge kind of like epic world building story going on within absolute carnage and i think if you're first off if you're reading if you read absolute carnage and you loved it i think you need to read the tie-ins i just think that it's going to add more to the story secondly if you're looking at it from a speculation perspective i think that look at what maximum carnage has become it's become a very profitable set um, these maximum cards used to be dollar books, and now that set is, is selling extremely well in the secondary market, over a hundred dollars many sales depending upon condition. And I, I think you're going to be similar with Absolute Carnage, although I think it's like 27 books deep for for the total uh, story, something like that. But you know, again, that's why not a lot of people are going to put that set together for sale purposes. They'll put it together to read it. Not a lot of people are going to put it together for sale purposes. So I think it's a good strategy. Grab a few copies of each, put a few sets together. Um, and again, wait till somebody's getting that FOMO at the end of the c series. And you know Donnie's going to bring some craziness in this in this story. And when that happens, people are going to be running back chasing. This is one book that I didn't pick up just because I kind of spent my budget for the week on other books. Kind of went heavy on a few other ones. But uh, this is definitely one that I plan to actually read online just because I want to keep up with the whole Absolute Carnage story. And I've said it before, I'm not... The biggest when it comes to i'll read the main storylines but i don't pick up a lot of the tie-ins like we mentioned with war of the realms right right but if absolute carnage is that good i hope they usually will put an omnibus out that has the whole storyline wrapped up in it and that's when you pick up the, the the complete story but yeah separation anxiety saw it there people were people were picking it up at my lcs but me budget wise i couldn't afford it this week so i left it on the left it on the shelf well, I totally understand budget-wise because there's some major releases this week. I think from a speculation perspective that we we're, we're going to talk about, and I, you know, I agree with you on the whole tie-ins, grab the omnibus at the end. But man, you know what? It, with this Donny Cage story, I'm all in on this. I read Absolute Carnage, and it had me just excited. It was one of those comics where you, that's why we love reading comics. When you read a comic and you put it down, and you're like, man, that was awesome. And then you want to pick it up and go back through it to look at the art really closely. And did I miss anything? Did I see anything? And then I'm looking online and I'm seeing stories about the Watchmen reference. I'm like, I didn't even catch that. And uh, yeah, it just, you know, that alone has me like, I can't wait for the next issue. So I'll settle for these tie-ins to get my, my absolute carnage fix. And the first time I've been kind of that excited about um, tie-in series is usually Marvel doesn't get me with those War of Realms isn't a good example but they got me this time and I was just going to say I mean War of the Realms I enjoyed it but when was the last time the last Marvel event type storyline that you were this excited about like yeah I, I really man that's a good one um, Civil War maybe and right. you're talking years at that point right. um, I, I have a hard time thinking of anything that got me like Civil War was game changing for me um, but I don't know that there was anything since then that I've really been, yeah, that's a great point. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So that that only kind of makes me feel more secure in my feeling that Absolute Carnage is a serious long-term play. Because Civil, look at Civil War. Look at, look at what that, I mean, that book still sells, even with the movies come and gone. People still want those Civil War sets. And at the height of the Civil War set, we were selling those seven book sets for like 150 bucks. Right. So, yeah, I think that's a good point, Brent. So they were talking about Absolute Carnage tie-ins. In the next book on the Reader Buzz section this week, we're talking Captain Marvel number nine. Captain Marvel number eight flew off shelves. We're talking about the first appearance of Star. Captain Marvel num number nine. As soon as, it was, as soon as this was listed on a lot of online sites, it sold out. What's the story with this issue? Okay, so here's the thing. 
first off, I'm a, let's get into this first appearance, first cameo, first full. <laughs> we don't play that game. We, we're not. We don't play that game. There's no definitive book on that, so we're not even gonna mess with that. And in, in both my opinion and Brian's opinion, Captain Marvel eight has about everything in it you could ask for for a first appearance. She appears, she talks, panels, you see the powers. What else do you want? So the only people who are out here trying to sell the next issue as a as a first full appearance, which by the way, this is clearly not. She's in this book less than the last book. But the only reason why people are trying to sell this book as a or were pre-release first full appearance, they missed out on eight. Um, and look, we all made this mistake. It's not, it's not any one person's fault. When you read the solicitations, you believed... Issue 10 was going to be Star's first appearance, right? Because Star was on the cover. Mark Brooks put that tweet out. New character coming, issue 10. And uh, that'll probably be like the first full appearance that people will go with. Um, but we all saw that coming. So like us smart, you know, in wrestling, you have smart marks, people who think they know more than, you know, the average wrestling fan. So like us smart marks in the comic game, we were like, well, you know, 10's too obvious, so it'll be 9. So look, a lot of us pre-ordered nine. A lot of us pre-ordered ten. Guess what I did? Guess what I didn't pre-order? Eight. But I'm also tr I'm transparent as can be on the Simple Moments Comics YouTube channel. That's just my mistake. I missed out. Marvel got me. Oh well. You know, you win some, you lose some. I grabbed the second print because I think it's gorgeous. Um, you know, Brian grabbed a couple of the uh, number eights off the shelf. They went in bolo boxes. Um, you know, so it, it is what it is. You can't sit there and play comic politics every time you miss out on something. We're seeing that with Ninja Turtles. Uh, we see that all over the place. I'm utterly tired of the cameo for, versus first full appearance argument. We're not talking about a character in the shadows. You know, we're talking about a character that clearly appeared. But why this book may actually have some interest and some value is what it Star may have done in this issue, but we didn't directly see it. Now, there were some reports all over the Internet saying Star died in this issue. Um, I, we even had those debates within CBSI circles. Star did not die in this er issue. Um, and again, I know you guys want to hear spoilers. That's been pretty much the consensus on the channel. You say, go ahead, give us the information. Well, you get that last page splash page and you see the death of Dr. Minerva. Um, and a lot of people thought that that was Star. A lot of, due to the lighting, you couldn't really get the bluish green skin um, real clear as day. But there were some giveaways from the costume to some of the tints in the in the character. It looks like Star may have killed her. It looked like Captain Marvel was coming for Star and you know she was or coming for Dr. Minerva and she was in the process of kind of talking junk to Dr. Minerva when she finds her dead. And there's an ominous message written on the wall and it looks like Star may have been the one to do it. This to me I listened to people this morning try to tell me dump Star. Dump Star this is obvious now. There's no money in Star. They're, look, they killed her. I sat and went, oh, no. First off, she didn't die. Second off, buy Star now. And you, Brian, you and I were sitting there like, and we don't know how this first appearance. First off, Brian's been a big one. I don't really care about Captain Marvel, so I don't really care either way. Um, and I was kind of like, yeah, new characters get created all the time. I'm not going to go get silly over one. And I honestly... Some of these new Marvel first appearances that pop off, whether it's Wolverine's 11th daughter or, you know, this new Captain Marvel character who's a doppelganger. I sit and I go, ah, what basis do we have to pay these high prices? But here's the thing. She killed a pretty major character, or at least we think, at least we assume she killed this character because I don't know who else would have done it. And I think it's going to be like this major storyline with her and Captain Marvel. And we've talked about it. Captain Marvel doesn't have really that nemesis, that person to go up against. And we know that the MCU is invested in Captain Marvel. They're, they're going to do more Captain Marvel movies. So I look at this and I go, there could be some spec play here. Now, I'm not, I don't want to pay these high prices for the first appearance of Star. But the prices have started to drop a bit. And I, I want to wait till some of the heat dies down. And I think there may be a spec play there. I also think, look, I pre-ordered those 10s and I felt bad about it because I was like, man, you know, I went heavy on 10. Eight was the one you should have had. Nope, because you know what? The comic politicians are going to do my job for me because they're going to argue 10s a first full appearance. I completely disagree, but I'll still sell the book uh, uh, and I'll be happy to take my money for it. But this one, I think, is, is the, if you're not reading the Captain Marvel series, which I don't typically, uh, I started paying attention with this star storyline. It's been a good read the last couple issues. So 
I know Brian, you're not a, you're not a Captain Marvel guy, but I tell you, man, you might want to check out these last couple of issues. I I know you probably pre-ordered some of those second prints. I know you probably you probably broke down on that. No, I didn't, no. but I did pick up the cover A today just because I'm a big Mark Brooks fan. Me too. Yeah, we both like Mark Brooks. What do you think about that um the the old school uh, variant there with the uh, the Marvel border? I enjoyed that because I love those '80s frame variants. Yeah, even though me too, like, man. That's one of those niche collections, right? Because a lot of those you can get for cheap, but I still buy them up just because I love the nostalgia of that '80s frame. So here we have the Marvel's 80th frame, and was it John Tyler Christopher that did those? Yeah, that's. And if you're not familiar with John Tyler Christopher, he's the man behind the Marvel action figure variants. So if you got really sick of those, you can blame him. But he he tends to do these like niche kind of style variants. I dig these, and there's gonna be more coming. Right. It's hard for me not to want to put that set together. Um, same way I, I love those original ones. That G.I. Joe cover with Snake Eyes on it is one of my favorite yeah. G.I. Joe covers of all time. And the Heathcliff and one. That gives Heathcliff. Good money. The, the Muppets. Yep. The Muppets is another Muppet good Baby's one. The Muppet Baby's 10. I literally found that one when I was preparing for the convention. I forgot I even had to have a newsstand of that sucker. And I was like, man, I don't know who's going to buy a Muppet Baby book from me at this convention but i'm surely gonna try yeah those things go for like 70 80 dollars muppet baby's yeah. tent and in, in, in higher grade yeah good money so. and uh there's a care bear book that yeah. does pretty well too so yeah. it, as funny as that sounds it, it, those star comics if you guys aren't aware are just short printed so they're just hard to find especially later in the series and a lot of people were putting those frame sets together it's easy to get G.I. Joe. It's easy to get the major Marvel characters, yeah. but it's really tough to get those star comics ones. Yeah, the Conan ones were good, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, the one cover, I was actually disappointed in this, and it seemed like, I don't know if they knew people might be or something, because it, it took a while for the art to show up for it, is that J.G. Jones, Marvel and their Bring on the Bad Guys. It's like, DC has the year of the villain, now it's like Marvel Bring on the Bad Guys, but I like J.G. Jones, but I'm not a fan of that cover, the one in the middle. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a big J.G. Jones fan as well, but, I, you know, we do the Hot and Cold show here on Civil Men's Comics YouTube channel. Brian, I think you'd agree, like, J.G. Jones has been kind of kind of cold for yeah. a while. Yeah, I'm a, like those old Batman and Robin covers you used to do that were um, really, really sharp. But this one, I don't know. It, it's, it's my least favorite of the three, but... I would agree. I would definitely agree. And the, I hate the whole bring on the bad guys concept. Yeah. It's just it doesn't even sound level. good. No, it's a, just a DC ripoff. I hate when they got to copy each other like that. Do your own thing. And they got enough good going with this series. And with, honestly, Marvel got a lot of good going in general right now. Or as much as people talk junk about Marvel publishing, at some point, man, you got to give credit where credit's due. War of the Realms was a pretty good storyline. They, they OD'd with the variants and everything. But Absolute Carnage is on fire. Lots of good number ones. A lot of reader buzz on Marvel books. Again, I'll plug the uh, back issue Bolo article on comicbookinvest.com. That's I highlight five or six Marvel series right now that are really just killing it from a reader buzz perspective. So they got a lot going on good right now. They don't need to try to compete with that aspect of DC, which we're going to talk about the mess with that in a little bit. And DC is kind of lagging behind, so they shouldn't even acknowledge second place. Right. And real quick, some other John uh, Tyler Christopher covers that when he did those Black Order variants, those were freaking nice. Yes, definitely. Without a doubt. And John Tyler Christopher, I bagged on those action figure variants, but you know, when they first came out, those were awesome. Especially were the great. Star Wars ones. It just gets to a point where it's like, man, I'm tired of seeing these. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because they all look the same. But Exactly. I'm down with action figure variants if you put a little new spin to it. We've been talking, we produce uh, exclusive variants. I've been saying somebody needs to do like a vintage, more vintage looking action figure variant where it looks has a little shelf wear to it things like that's what i want to see i don't want to see i don't want to see all these you know cookie cutter ones that they keep coming out with but i understand john todd christopher's gonna pump these things out so there's going to be some elements of kind of sameness amongst them but for the ones like those he did the marvel ones he also did the earlier gi joe action figure variants the snake eyes yeah the baroness those were great real real good real good and there's hey again you just led me into it we've been talking this we're going to talk about something else later on that we tried to give you guys the heads up on, and you guys didn't fully listen. Some of you out there did, but some of you didn't. So we've been telling you, G.I. Joe 266, they've got this connecting action figure set coming from 266 to 270. Every G.I. Joe is going to be featured from 266 on. This story is Snake Eyes versus Snake Eyes. This is going to be a hot story, so be on the lookout for that one. 
But we're going to move right now on into the Reader Buzz section. And the next book on the list was Chosen number one. This had some buzz coming into it, which is why it's on the Reader Buzz section. I've heard mixed opinions. I haven't had a chance to read this issue yet. Some people really enjoy it. Some people are kind of like, meh. But I have it coming. Haven't received it yet. It's on my pre-order list. Should receive it within the next day or two. But what's the buzz you heard about this book, Jack? Now, I heard a lot of positive buzz pre-release from people who read that like sneak preview that Mad Cave likes to put out. Um, I mentioned to Brian before the show, if, if it wasn't for the book that's in the long-term play of the week, this probably would have been it. Again, you know we've produced some variants with Mad Cave. Mad Cave's kind of been on fire with some of their new release books. They've done a great job kind of picking some stories that have these like real kind of different approaches to, to the – concepts than what's kind of currently out on the market this has got like a 1920s georgia circus kind of vibe very cool um the book's selling again it's wednesday night right now the day of new comic book day you're getting 10 to 15 dollars sales on this book already and most of them are 10 dollars plus four dollars shipping so you're seeing about 14 dollars shipped average on the sale that's real good for, you know, new comic book day. And I just think it's indicative of the fact that Mad Cave doesn't put out these huge, um, you know, print runs on these books. They're not easy to get. A lot of stores, you know, I said, I mentioned I'm from South Carolina. I went, you know, my LCS didn't even have the book. And they kind of gave me that look like, hmm, when I asked about Show's End. So, you know, that's one of those things that ends up happening is you see that a lot. A lot of people take that for granted. If you're from New York or Florida or California, you may take for granted, or even the Baltimore area where Brian's from, um, you know, you, people may take for granted, you know, the fact that though these books aren't always readily, readily available to everybody across the country. I also, I got my Gamecock cup right here, but I want to give a shout out to my man, Andy Tomberlin, uh, Mr. Clemson. Um, he released uh, tonight at 10 p.m. his Bat Comic Shop variant, limited to 120, and he's been selling brisk brisk sales on that one so shout out to andy he's got a gorgeous cover um there's some nice there's some nice retailer exclusive variants out there for these and you know retailer exclusive variants aren't always we don't talk about them a lot here on the channel they're not always good investments but we saw with our knights of the golden sun variant which shot up to about fifty dollars um and we did really well with it, and it, I, it's done well in the secondary market. It still does well on the secondary market. We released a Virgin Limited Edition Collector's Edition, and it did even better. Um, sold out extremely fast, per run of 100. And I just think it's like the thing where, you know, these books are so tough to get. They're so limited that people are always are willing to go get multiple covers of this because it's it's tough. These are these are tough to get, tough to find books. And these books only printed to 120 so how many times do you see that? We talk about astronomical print runs with absolute carnage. You're talking about a real micro print run when you're talking about 120. So I don't know if by the time this airs, if you're going to be able to go to batcomicshop.com and get uh, get one of these shows and variants. And I have a feeling it may be sold out. But, uh, you know, definitely, definitely be on the lookout for more of these Mad Cave, um, uh, you know, limited edition variants coming and you know what i'm gonna throw a teaser out there brian i don't even know if we're allowed to do this man but boy do we have a good one coming that's all i'm gonna say i'm just gonna put it out there right there i'm gonna say we got a good one coming and also he mentioned the bat comic shop but if you're also just looking for this issue make sure you check out mad cave's website because they do sell them up there at times absolutely and we mentioned knights of the golden sun if you didn't get a chance to read that i really enjoyed that story Volume 1 came out today in trade paperback as well. So if you're looking to catch up on it, you can get that trade paperback and catch up on that Knights of the Golden Sun story. But yeah, shows in number one on the Reader Buzz this week. And going into the next comic on the Reader Buzz, we have Go Go Power Rangers number 22. Continuing that Necessary Evil storyline. Again, we saw Go Go Power Rangers 21 pop off. Go Go Power Rangers does not do the print run that Mighty Morphin Power Rangers does. A lot of people, you know, there was like some misconception. I'm not even going to go into where that came from. But there was some misconception about a first appearance with Go Go Power Rangers 21. That was not why Brian and I have been talking to you guys about Go Go Power Rangers. It's the fact that this necessary evil storyline is so big for Boom. I wish I could tell you where it's going, but it, it's going somewhere. And... 
the sets of this are going to be in major demand and they will always be important back issues for Power Ranger fans. And I am so bullish on Power Rangers' property. It got bought by Hasbro. It's no longer Saban. Hasbro, again, they have the AllSpark Productions, the movie company with Paramount where they just released the Bumblebee movie. It did well. So much talk this week about G two G.I. Joe movies. You know I'm excited for that. A Snake Eyes solo movie and a G.I. Joe team movie. A Power. They just announced that they scrapped the Power Rangers movie, uh, meaning the sequel with the, the, the last cast, which I think is great because I think we're going to get a Lord Draken movie. Uh, and so I'm bullish on all things Power Rangers. When this series goes where it's going to go, People are going to be going back, and it's going to be hard to get GoGo -Go Power Rangers 21. It's going to be hard to get GoGo -Go Power Rangers 22. It's going to be hard to get GoGo -Go Power Rangers 23. Um, and the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers part of this story is selling extremely well, especially those foil variants. They're selling very well. And I will say, check out Midtown had those on sale for 60% off. And that, that's not indicative of the book being cold, because I've been selling those so easily at the last two conventions I've been at. Um, I just think it's been indicative of the fact that Midtown orders so much and their mainstream customer base just isn't up on that. That's why we, we're giving you guys game here on the Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel. But, you know, this one I think is great. Um, I think it's going to go under the radar. I don't think it's going to be a big buzz book. This is more of a long-term play. Um, we saw the Tragic Kingdom homage, uh, the, the No Doubt homage with 21, 22, you get NSYNC. So I know that may not uh, that may not do it for you, or maybe it does. I don't know, you know. But uh, it, it's definitely interesting that they're coming with these music homages. I think it's pretty cool. Right? Yeah, that in sync one, man. That's ter that's tearing up my heart right there. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of hate on those cover Bs and cover Cs, though. A lot of people don't like the yearbook variants or the Instagram uh, variants. How do you feel about those, Brad? I I think I would side with the majority. They're just they don't have that gravitas to them like when i first saw the cover up for it i was like is that really the cover but i mean we saw um just each one has a different picture so it's fitting that theme but to me the favorite cover on this out of this all of these is i actually like the cover a the best me too i do too i will say i i like the yearbook ones more than i like the instagram ones and i do like the fact that as you build the run you'll be able to build sets individually of them I, I get the Instagram thing. Obviously, Brian and I do a ton of Instagram. We run the comicbookinvest.com, Instagram, Simplements Comics Instagram, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo Instagram. We're heavy on Instagram. We're on our way to 10K, so if you're not uh, following the Instagram account, be sure to follow at comicbookinvestcbsi on Instagram. Once we hit 10K, we're going to be able to direct link videos. It's going to be good for you. It's going to be good for us. It's going to be a real symbiotic thing, so make sure you do that. But, uh, yeah, the Instagram one's too much white on the border. It's just not visually appealing. I like the concept in theory, but it doesn't look great. I, I think the painted um, cover, though, look of the um, of the yearbook covers, I think is more appealing. I kind of dig that one. But, yeah, cover A is the way to go. With 21, I went heavier with cover B, thinking, you know, thinking old school variant over cover A. I switched that up this time around. Definitely cover A is the way to go. Right. I would think it's cool if you're a fan of, of the Power Rangers and you're a fan of some of these actors to get that yearbook one and then get it witnessed and signed, but signed like a yearbook, like have a kick-ass summer and then sign. That, you know, that is, that is, we talked about on the hot and cold show. We just talked about yeah. if you're going to do SS books come unique. That's a great idea. And those Power Ranger actors are accessible. Yeah. They're out there at conventions. Um, they do LCS visits and things like that. Brian, that is a good idea to get the inscription there. That that is a unique yep. collectible where you could almost name your price. Yeah. So, so there you have it. Go go Power Rangers twenty two. Next on the Reader Buzz section, we have Powers of X number two. This is a book that's gained some hype. I don't know if it's because of the book itself or because of what House of X number two is doing. But what do we have to say about this, Jack? All right. So yeah, I got plenty to say about this. First off. This book is doing extremely well. We're getting reports from retailers that this book, again, it's Wednesday night. If you look on eBay, you're seeing sales of around six to ten dollars. Uh, so again, it's important to add that shipping in. You know, people aren't just paying that six dollars or five dollars that that you see highlighted. You're also paying that shipping. So that means a customer is willing to pay five to six. You see, I got to lean in for this one because it's serious. Brian's gonna have a link in the description 
of a video, another YouTube channel. Don't click it while you're watching this. Finish the, finish the show, take your time, and go back. It's a great channel called One Minute Economics. And it's just going to give you a one minute. We're all cartoon guys, right? We're all comic book guys. It's going to give you a one minute uh, kind of cartoon on Pump and Dump. Why do I bring up Pump and Dump? Well, this book was the topic of conversation on our Facebook page. I am sorry to many of you who try to go on that Facebook page without having to deal with a lot of personalities, to say it nicely, um, on the Facebook page. But this book was being called out as a pump and dump book. And I don't know who people were calling out for pump and dump. There was a story about a, uh, uh, a LCS situation where a person walked in and bought like 20 copies off the shelf and nobody else got a copy. Again, that's going to happen. That's terrible. I hate when that happens. Um, I don't advocate you to like raid your LCS of copies. At the same point, it's not the individual's job to police that. It's the store's job to police that. And in this situation, an employee did it unbeknownst to the to the owner. I would hope the owner had a stern talking to with the employee and that that was handled. That's short. Again, we talk about short term versus long term for the store. That's that's not makes no sense. But pump and dump is not somebody I hate that term. I hate, I, we hear it, Brian, God, eight years, how many times have we heard that? We, 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 all we ever hear is pump and dump. Yeah. To the powers of 10. Yes. Million. <laughs> right. It's once a week we hear pump and dump, pump and dump. No one understands what pump and dump is. Pump and dump is a scheme, right? It's a scheme where a person buys up a large quantity of something. You have to have a large quantity to execute a pump and dump. And when I say a large quantity, I don't mean 20. What do you think the print run is of this, Brian? 50,000 at least, right? You'd right. assume, right? Maybe 100,000. So somebody who buys 20 copies cannot physically pump and dump. Let's understand that. Yes, with a platform like CBSI, theoretically, we could pump and dump, right? Because we, we have like influence. We have a platform. But here's why we can't pump and dump. Here's why CBSI could never actually pump and dump. Because to pump and dump something, you have to talk about a book and you have to lie. Saying that I, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo, believe in a book is not a pump and dump. Saying CBSI, which believes in a book, is not a pump and dump, which we've never done because there is no CBSI. It's a, CBSI is a group of individuals who work together. Again, we're like Voltron. We come together and we form a, a, a media unit. There's no, no conversation like where we all get together and say, this is the book that we're promoting and pushing. Everybody says different things. You go to 10 different articles on comicbookinvest.com. You're going to see one guy who loves it, one guy who hates it, one guy who thought it was okay. You're not paying attention to think that CBSI as a brand is pump and dumping. And just because I like a certain book, I like G.I. Joe. I'm not pump and dumping G.I. Joe. I mean, I tell you something I believe in. It doesn't mean I might not be wrong. If I'm wrong about a spec, I'm not pump and dumping. I'm still just telling you what I believe in. And here's the thing. If we were to make up false news, like to, to pump and dump, you'd have to take a book like this and say, yeah, they're going to make a House of X number two movie. They're going to make a, a movie based on House of X, but it's going to be specifically about the characters in number two. You know, it, it would work better in this scenario with an indie book, right? Like, let's say Show's End that we just talked about. Well, I, I heard a rumor they're going to make a Show's End movie. It's already in production. I'd have to make that up to cause market demand. Here's the thing. If I did that, yeah, some other media might jump on and go, oh, according to CBSI, this is what's going to happen. But we got a lot of haters out there, guys. A lot of other people in the me – a lot of other media sources, a lot of other speculation websites, a lot of comic apps would love nothing more than to be able to debunk our story and go ahead and say, no, they're making that up or this is just not factually true. So it wouldn't work. It would, it would just make a fool out of us. And it wouldn't be worth it for whatever short-term profits you think we're going to make or that you think anyone's going to make. To pump and dump, you have to affect the entire market of a book or of any entity. It's commonly used in the stock market. If you've ever seen the movie Boiler Room, if you haven't seen it, I absolutely suggest you go see it. Um, Vin Diesel, Giovanni Ribisi, great movie. That movie is about pump and dumping. They're taking stocks worth nothing artificially inflating them, making people believe that things are going to happen in the market that are never going to happen. They sell them at high prices. Then they leave the consumer who bought these things holding a stock, or in this case, a comic book, that they cannot sell at the price that it was inflated to. Just because somebody says they believe in a book, it's not a pump and dump because that's not happening. Just because 
some jerk walks into an LCS and buys 20 copies of a book because some other retailer says it's going to be hot or because some website says it's going to be hot does not make it a pump and dump. Please stop using that term in the comics market. I beg you because it is the most misused term. And if you don't believe me, please click in the description, click that video, get a quick economics lesson. It's one minute. It's one minute of your time. And, and this, these are the types of things. These sources are available to you. There's a lot of unscrupulous things that do happen in the comic market. But you have to ask yourself, are we, are we really talking about the right things? And that's the problem is then we can't address the issues that we really have going on in the comic market. We can't address the things that are really going on in the speculation market because people get caught up with this term pump and dump. In full transparency, yes, CBSI, we've heard those accusations for years. But it, this is why I'm talking about it. We laugh at that because we can't pump and dump a Marvel book. And in order to pump and dump, like even a small press publisher, like the smallest, like Mad Cave, we'd have to own like 40 to 50% of the stock of a book. Reach out to any publisher you want and see how impossible it is because their books go through diamond for us to order that many or acquire that many. Also, any LCS can order these books, so we have no control over buying up that many stocks. It's not like a, a, that much of a stock. It's not like the stock market where there's a controlled set amount of shares. Any book pre-FOC can be ordered as much as you want. So if you came here to watch me talk about um, Powers of X number two, and you're like, man, he's not really talking about Powers of X number two. I'm sorry. But obviously, pump and dump is something that is heavily talked about in our market. It drove me nuts today getting into this debate on Facebook. I got to stop debating with these people on Facebook. And uh, yeah, so that's my uh, my little economics lesson from AKA Mr. Bolo talking about pump and dump. And Brian, I'm sorry, I won't take any more of uh, Simpleman's Comics time to discuss this. We're all good. You mentioned Boiler Room. Great movie. <laughs> I'm good at what I do, Dad. I'm good at what I do. I love Giovanni Ribisi. He's an underrated actor. Yes, which by chance, if you haven't watched it, make sure you watch Sneaky Pete on Amazon Prime. Yeah, I just started watching. That's a good show. So, and we're going to move right on into the next on the Reader Buzz. And we're going to talk about Reaver number two. So we've had this discussion. Everyone's like, Reaver's, num Reaver's hot, Reaver's hot. And we're talking about, hey, there's only one issue out yet. Let's wait for more issues before we like say this book is such a great book. Issue number two came out today. Also... I'm not going to say that because we're going to talk about that in a little, a little bit later on. But issue number two came out. This was another book that I did read, and I still enjoy it. I'm still liking Reaver. A lot of people, the Becky Cloonan cover with the interior art, a lot of people still not liking that interior art as much. I don't have a problem with it. The story's great, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, and that's the thing is, you know, you got to give a series a certain number of issues. I like to say three or four issues at least. Yeah, at least the arc. One arc. Right, and people people were all over issue one. That was obviously a hot book. It was a CBSI Hot 10 book. It, you know, it was going $10, $15 in the secondary market. It's still commanding that price. Um, but yeah, issue two isn't selling on the secondary market, but it gives more validity to the series because it continued the hot streak of reader buzz. It continued a streak of people picking it up. Yeah, you're hearing the same thing. The interior art may not be for you. I get that. Um, for some people, that interior art may eliminate them from wanting to read the book. But, you know, I, there's plenty of people out there like Brian who are like, yeah, I may not love the interior art, but the stories kick ass. So I'm going to keep reading it and I enjoy it. So, yeah, I like the Becky Cloonan cover for sure. Um, I think Reaver is a sleeper hit. I think it's I think it's going to continue to do well. I think uh, the more issues that get released, the more popularity we see with this book, the more issue number one is going to retain value. Um, so I, I like this book. And we got a new subscriber, so thank you to Andrew Jones. But I'm seeing a trend also with a lot of these type sci-fi, fantasy, that type period storylines. But there's enough differentiation between, like, let's say – White Trees and Reaver, where that makes both stories fun to read. It's kind of that token-esque, Game of Thrones, however you want to mention it. Reaver number two is great. Fantastic battle towards the end of that. If you haven't read it, I suggest you pick it up. We're seeing more and more, too, these like almost R-rated releases coming out, where these more kind of, um, they're pushing boundaries with their stories more and more. And you know what? I think people like it. Yeah. Yes. 
and the chick in there, the skin eater chick, she's badass, man. Yeah. So, and last book on the reader buzz section this week, we're going to talk about Justice League Odyssey number 12. So what's the big buzz on this book, Jack? Talk about a late breaker to the CBSI Bolo show and the Bolo list. Again, we're going to, we're going to spoil this one. Um, you see the cover B. First off, what everyone knew was Dark Side is coming. Um, we talked about in the Hot and Cold show about Dark Side and how Dark Side apparently is coming to the New Gods movie. There's a lot of buzz on Dark Side. Dark Side early appearances are doing extremely well. Um, let's harken back to the New 52. How great was that Justice League run where we had the first appearance of Grail in issue 40? Uh, Grail, of course, is Dark Side's daughter. Issue 50 was phenomenal with, with, with that whole Dark Side war story. So a lot of people were anticipating the return of Dark Side. We got the return of Dark Side, but if you look at that cover B, who do we see on the far right of that cover B but Jessica Cruz, another spec darling, and another one where we got the cameo first appearance argument like crazy. Is it Green Lantern 20? Is it, which, yes, it's Green Lantern 20. Let me just go ahead and tell you that right now. But is it Justice League 30? Is it Justice League 31? The truth is, I was buying and selling all of those. But I was absolutely stunned to see it appears Darkseid killed Jessica Cruz. I can't figure this out. I, I, Brian and I were talking about this before the show. I said, I've never seen a character that a company seemed to put money into, like Jessica Cruz, talk of her showing up in a movie. That's all people were speculating on. Some of the most trusted speculators, the most respected speculators in the game, were going heavy on Jessica Cruz. I mean, I'll go ahead and name drop the original owner of CBSI. Trey Kenyon, he was heavy on Jessica Cruz. That was one of his big bet plays way back when, uh, back when he was involved with CBSI. Um, and, you know, I can't say, like, I'm not hating on him for that because, uh, shoot, I felt kind of the same way. Now, I'll say, when Jessica Cruz blew up, I ain't gonna lie, I sold those uh, incentives for Green Lantern 20. I was happy to get take my money for those. Now I'm really glad I did because she's no more, I guess. But you know what? It's comics. And that, so I said to Brian, I said, they got to bring her back, right? They got, they got, there's, there's got to be some way she's coming back. This can't be, or maybe there's some deception where, cause you know, it's, it's one of those last page deaths where it's like, could there be more to this story? Are we going to get some Thanos snap situation, rewind type deal? I don't know. But either way, it, if you didn't read the issue, check it out. Um, pretty shocking how that whole thing plays out. And, um, there's certainly spoilers out there. You certainly grab the digital if you just want to check it out. But Dark Side coming back is a big deal. Dark Side's going to be red hot in the secondary market. So um, there's also that long term value there. I think Justice League Odyssey doesn't do the numbers that the regular Justice, Justice League book does. Um, so you know there's there's some value there from speculation play. I don't know. You know this is a this is a big issue. It's a big event. We saw the death of Dr. Minerva with Captain Marvel. We're seeing the death of Jessica Cruz. I feel like we got a range of emotions. I was angry with the pump and dump conversation. Uh, absolute carnage has me excited. My long-term play has me uh, feeling a little braggadocious over here. Um, and uh, yeah, this, you know, the deaths have me sad. So we got the range of emotion going around on New Comic Book Day today, Brian. Right. And as you said, we were talking about before the show between – Back, what, years ago, we are talking about her. We were talking about Simon Baz, we're talk, you know, the Green well, Lantern number Simon zero Baz? variant, that free comic book day issue that came out. So it's funny to see Spec come out and then did it play out or is there still more to tell in the story? So just League Odyssey number 12, it's on the Reader Buzz section. Let us know what you think in the comments. Is she gone for yeah. good? Is she not gone? Is she coming back? Will she be someone else? We'll see. Maybe she yeah, come back as a wonder twin. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we were all hoping when there was talk of that J.J. Abrams Green Lanterns movie. I think we were all ho hoping that, that she was going to be featured front and center in that. I don't know now. Yeah. Jessica Alba Cruz. Yeah, yeah, I would like that. I'm all for that. <laughs> but, so there we have it. That's going to finish up the Reader Buzz section. So like we said before, if you guys have just tuned in beforehand, 
We are not actually live tonight. We are actually doing a premiere. We recorded this Wednesday night, but we do want to thank everyone that's in the chat right now. And if you would, please do us a huge favor and click that thumbs up button for us. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing because we always have new content coming up on this channel weekly. But with that being said, we will get into the variant buzz section right now. And kicking us off on the variant buzz, this is definitely a lot of buzz this week. And we are talking about Superman number 14 and Supergirl number 33 covers being recalled, right? Right. So A and B, I guess, are being recalled right. from what I understand. Yeah, originally they were showing the A covers, but I guess both. Yeah, both. Um, something to do apparently with the year of the villain tie-in, the fact that the covers actually don't fe feature like those villain-centric covers, I guess. Um, we didn't get a ton of information about it. Uh, you know, a lot of people are excited by this. I don't like this. I'm going to be honest with you. There's plenty of ways for us to make money, right? But the relationship between publisher, distributor in Diamond, and retailer is very important. Like if you get if your retailer gets cut off from from Diamond, how can they make money? They're going to become a back issue only store. So notice was put out pretty early from from um, DC that they were going to recall these books. They wanted these books destroyed. They didn't want these books hitting the market. Obviously, when that happens, retailers start trying to take advantage and sell books. But DC put out a really strong word that they didn't want that this time. They were really serious, so serious that they were like, we're going to ship you your books and we're not going to charge you. We're going to make up for this. Um, this has been a mess because copies were pre-sold all over eBay. I, I really don't like this speculation play. Yeah, I get it. I get where speculators are coming from. It could be a rare variant. But – Brian, you and I, maybe we're old, jaded vet veterans, but as long as we've been in the game, we've seen these recalled books a bunch of times. Rarely do they hold value because people are like, well, they're going to be limited, but are people really going to care about a Superman and a Supergirl cover um, to some random issue? And I'm talking about two years from now? It's, or, or is it going to be just some you know footnote at some point? Um, I don't foresee these being books that like five years from now, somebody's going to be like, I got to have those. Um, and you know, it's, it, it's not one that I think we should, I don't even think there, there's a moral issue in this because if you're buying this from your LCS and you're posting it on Instagram and stuff like that, you're really running the risk. If you, especially if you're naming where you bought it from of getting your LCS in trouble. So if you have a good relationship with your LCS, don't do that. Um, Dan D Didio, the, or I'm probably mispronouncing that. Don't kill me in the comments section, guys. Um, Dan Didio, Dan Dido, I don't know. Um, he, he does his retailer, um, video where he does a video where he chats with retailers on Facebook. That's another thing, guys. If you're sharing that with other people, um, you're violating your contract in that way. Why do I know about that? I'm not a retailer. Um, I know about it cause a speculation site put it, that information up and not CBSI. Um, and you know, he said that they, did, they were going to take this very seriously. People were going to lose accounts. People were going to lose diamond accounts. People were going to lose access to DC Comics. This was a very serious issue that they were monitoring. I, I have a um, retailer member of CBSI who's a, who's a good good friend of the show who likes to let me know information. He said that they were calling people. They were calling stores saying, you know, hey, I see this eBay auction. Is this you? Um, you know, what do you have going on with this? We talked to you about this. This – we, remember when I was talking about Walking Dead 193 and I said, you know, a store was going for short term money over long term money. If Yeah, I get the thirty dollars is a draw, but trying to make that money in the short term, if that costs you your ability to get new DC comics, you're missing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars so you can make hundreds of dollars. And that just doesn't make sense. If you're a speculator, um, yeah, I get why you would want this book. I get why you as a flipper would want this book. But I'm going to tell you, if you bought this book, please sell this now. Just get your money out of this. Make your money and move on. Because, you know, like I said, Brian and I have been this, at this point a long time. I feel like every six months, right, Brian, there's one of these kind of books. There's some book where the cover's not what it's supposed to be. We talked about Dead Rabbit on the cold list uh, yeah. just last night, uh, you know, where Dead Rabbit got pulled because of copyright issues. It's dead cold now. No one cares. Um, and let's be honest, Supergirl – 
and Superman even don't command anything on the secondary market unless it's like major keys. These are not major keys. Now, I believe the Supergirl issue is the first appearance of a new Brainiac. But like, let's be honest about that. How many Brainiacs are there? So that's, you know, unless they're going to do something specifically with that Brainiac. But there's Brainiac on Krypton right now. No one really cares about that. So I, I don't... I, it's not that's not a first appearance I'm gonna get hyped about, you know. And by the way, Krypton's an underrated show. It's a good show, but literally nobody cares about spec related to Krypton. Because it's on uh, Sci Fi Channel. <laughs> yeah, but that's why the Sci Fi app is good. Get that Sci Fi app. It's don't worry about watching the channel. Just check out the app. This Happy's a good show. There's plenty of good shows on there, but <laughs> you know, uh, um, but yeah, I just don't. I don't like this. This is just this. People talk about pump and dump. This is skeevy to me. You know, you, you got it. Your relationship with the publisher is important. Retailers are the first ones to cry when Diamond doesn't ship what they're supposed to get. And rightfully so. Look, I'm not saying that retailers shouldn't. But I'm just saying, you got to be honest with yourself. You're the first one to cry when you get short on an order. You're the first one to cry when something gets damaged. You're the first one to yell at at the publisher for, for not putting the right, you know, cover art image or whatever. And then here you are, you get a situation where the retailer goes, hey, we made a mistake. We're going to look out for you because we made the mistake. And you're like, no, I'm going to put my hand back in the cookie jar and sell these for an inflated price. Shout out to all the retailers who are above that. Um, my guy who gave me this information about what, a lot of what was going on said, you know, it's not worth it to him. It's not worth it for him to go ahead and, you know, piss off one of the two major publishing houses in comics just for, you know, some short-term cash. And, you know, shout out to the retailers who stuck to their guns on that and didn't backdoor these copies because it's not worth getting caught. You guys know I'm from the sneaker industry. A lot of that dirty backdoor type stuff happens in the sneaker industry. Um, let's keep that out of comics, please, God. That's why, that's why I'm trying to make that move. So, you know, I, I don't love this play. I know a lot of people are going to kill me in the comment section because they're going to think that this is the next great thing. That's fine. Uh, let me know in the comments section. Let me know in the live chat if you disagree with me. But yeah, I know there's people in our Discord, our, our page, Simple Men's Family Patreon, who have been excited about this one. But that's my hot take. I don't like this one. I think this stuff is not healthy for the hobby. It's not good for the hobby. Yeah, for me, it, it didn't affect me one way or another because those are two titles I don't read. And I don't, you know, I understand... There's a whole site out there for recall of comics and how much, you know, you always see, oh, this book is so valuable because it was recalled at one time. But this doesn't excite me, so it doesn't chase it. So I'm kind of numb. Um, and so once this isn't the hot book of the week, no one yeah. will care because everyone will feel, let's be honest, who's reading Superman and Supergirl right now? Yeah. So, yeah, and I don't have a diamond account, so I'm not selling them. So, I, you know, yeah. I'm not going to get repercussions from it so yeah it wasn't moving on stupid books yeah. no skin in the game yep but the next one this is one i was going to talk earlier when we were talking about reaver number two second print for reaver number one came out uh my lcs third eye comics the smaller one again down here in southern maryland they had about three of these on the shelf and i saw Three of them get picked up in like a minute and a half as soon as the comic book store opened. So people want the second print. New art, which is one thing we always advocate. If you're going to do a second print, it's nice to see new art on it. Yes. I actually like this second print cover better than the first print cover. Me too. This I just said this as soon as you put this image up. like That's how I feel about this. This is incredible art. I, it's standout. Um, I'm interested to see what the print run of this is compared to the first print. Because sometimes those image second prints, they can be low. Yeah. They can be real low prints, but I, I like this book. I also think it's really smart marketing when a publishing company comes out with the second print the, of number one the same day that the first print of number two comes out because it lets those who may have missed out on Reaver and maybe didn't want to pay that $15 price on eBay get both. Um, be on the lookout. Canto is doing that. The day that Canto 3 hits – and you guys know on this channel, if you're not familiar, we're big on Canto. We called that one way in advance. We, we get a lot of flack for talking pre-FOC books. But when we're right, we're right. And we're going to brag a little bit more later. But Canto, we let you guys know way in advance pre-FOC that that book was going to do what it did. The second print of number one did well. Now, the day that number three comes out, 
the second print of number two comes out and the third print of number one comes out. I think that's smart. It lets readers who are, guys, again, when we started doing all of this content on the channel, one of Brian and my major goal was to pitch the fact that reading comics isn't just cool and fun and, you know, good for your brain and all of that. It was also a good speculation tool because it, everything starts with reading. If readers buy up a book, the book sells. And that's what Reaver is. Reaver, you can talk about the art, you can talk about the print run, you can talk about all that. But readers read issue number one and liked it. And that's why we're getting a second print for number one. That's why Brian read issue number two and he said he liked it. And he's on board for issue number three, I would assume. So this gave you a chance to walk into your LCS today and get issue number one and issue number two at the same time and be able to read these books and see how you feel. And again, if you bought issue number one, issue number two, and you're in it for eight bucks, and you're like, you know what, it's not for me, you're in it for eight bucks, and I bet you can get your money out of it. I bet you can flip it and get your money out of it and just break even. But it gives you that low-cost buy-in where you don't have to make some big investment buying 10 copies of number one at $15 each. You can. This gives you alternative options. Also, there's a good chance that this second print could take off later on because the cover art's phenomenal and it seems like this book is going somewhere so yeah make sure you check out that reaver second print we like the art on it great story and next on the variant buzz section this week we are talking about catwoman number 14 art germ i love this cover because it's not that traditional art germ type art it's got that almost more animated cartoon type feel to it but dc cover bees they show out in previews but way before People can get plenty of orders in, so it's not something that's scarce, even though the cover's fantastic. We've talked about how cover bees are kind of underperforming, but I still love this cover, and I actually pre-ordered five copies just to have in my collection. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, Brian, though. I was checking eBay sales before we jumped on and did this. This book is selling, though. It's not necessarily booming above cover price, but again, if you're seeing a sale on eBay for cover price, remember, somebody's paying shipping, too which means somebody out there is paying eight to $10 for these books. That's important to note. It's not $5 shipped or $4 shipped. It's, you know, it's about $8 shipped. So I, I look at this one and say, there might be some potential here with this book. I, we all loved it when we saw the art. Um, the last few ones that Art Germ's done, you got the one that kind of homage, the old school Catwoman came straight off the page of like the golden age cover. Then you get the kind of Michelle Pfeiffer looking, um, Batman Forever, or what was it, yeah. Bat, you know, Batman Returns cover. Yeah. Um, we all love that one, too. And now you get, yeah, the, the Batman Adventures, the Batman animated series-looking cover. I like what Archer's doing with these. He's really kind of... He, you know what he's showing you is how versatile of an artist he is. He, got, he caught a lot of flack for a while for kind of doing the same thing over and over again. But he's showing you, like, now I'm, I can come with different kinds of heat, and they're all popular. I think the Batman Adventures crowd, the Batman animated series crowd, they're a little bit younger, Brian, than you and I. Um, but they're they they're strong. My young, I have a younger brother, man, who grew up on that stuff, and uh, he was hip to Harley Quinn far before I was. And you know, I think that this this type of cover is going to speak to that like twenty eight to thirty thirty two crowd. And I, I have a feeling about this one. This one could be a serious long term hold. I like you, Brian. I grabbed several copies. Maybe you and I are just beating our head against the wall with these DC cover bees. I don't know. Maybe maybe we just were too stubborn to give up on these things. Yeah. Um, but I really believe, and you really believe, I know that, that some of these are going to break through. We're both long-term guys. We're, we're not, you know, we got patience. That comes with age, with wisdom. You can, you can, you can be patient, but, uh, you know, I don't need to make everything be a weekend flip. So these, I think, have a chance. I'll tell you what else, Brian, I, you, I, we haven't talked about this. I've been actually meaning to talk to you about this all week. Um, I've talked several times about how I did two straight conventions. Guess what sold well at two straight conventions? DC Cover Bees. Wow. DC Cover Bees sold. I had them priced at about 5 to $6 a cover, so a little bit over cover. Um, you know, I, I buy them at a discount below cover, what pretty good below cover. Um, and I was surprised. First off, the art is beautiful. Second off, I heard a lot of the same story. My LCS didn't order this one or didn't get that one. And um, like the Lois Lane, Adam Hughes, I sold several copies of that. You know, I just, they sold really well. Uh, and it made me feel good that like maybe, 
maybe there's there is something here. So I don't know. Maybe it's the area of the country I'm in. Um, maybe it's you know the specific shows I was at. Time is gonna tell. But they did do well and they surprised me. I had several people picking up five and six at a time. So it it it, it was something to open my eyes. So. At least for now, I'm going to continue riding this DC cover B uh, thing until maybe I sit there and go, what am I doing? Right. And I still think those early rebirth, the cover Bs, I still think those are actually underordered. Like yeah. the Frank Cho for Wonder Woman, Neil Adams was doing Green Arrow. You know, they all had like kind of a bigger artist assigned to a title for like the first however many issues. And at the time, you saw a lot more cover A's on the shelf than you saw cover Bs. Right. And then you started seeing the switch where it was almost 50-50. And then as you saw these titles coming out earlier, people being aware of them, they were pre-ordering also from the LCSs. But like you said, time will tell. And you were talking about this. I think this might be how we were talking about the nostalgia of the the Marvel frame variants with you talking about animated series and stuff. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe this could be their Marvel frame variant down the road when they go back and pick some of these up. That's a great point, Brian. That's a great point because you and I get the feels when we look at those Marvel frame variants because that's our era. This may give that younger crowd the same thing. And that younger crowd is heavy. They're out there. They're buying comics. Yeah. Just not as many as we were because at least they were like 75 cents to a dollar. Then now it's $5 a book. You got to move a lot more lines. It's a whole different game now, baby. It's a whole (laughs) different beast. (laughs) Yep. But so we're going to move into the variant buzz section and we're going to talk about Silver Surfer Black number three. And this is the one in 25 variant. You know what? This is I'm gonna call it like I see it. This is a flop. Um, th- there's a lot of buzz on this one. We've talked about this before on the channel. So speculators tend to kind of follow certain trends. And Silver Surfer Black Number Two was a hit, right? And it was a hit because of that Marcos Martin cover. And I even saw this. Love you guys in our Discord chat. Love you guys in the Patreon. But I saw a lot of you guys even falling into this pattern. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I didn't want to be too negative, but I didn't. We hadn't seen the cover art yet of this, right? As soon as people made the flip and started making money on number two, they immediately pivoted and were like, "Well, let me go pre-order number three because I'm going to make that money." But you know, at the same point, you got to make those mistakes. You got to learn from those mistakes um, so you can kind of get better and sharpen your sword of speculation. That doesn't always work, guys. Now, I think long-term Silver Surfer Black is a winner. Um, It's another book I got asked a lot about over the last couple weekends was Silver Surfer Black, whether it was number one, number two, variants. And I know number one is like $1.80 on the Midtown sale. Again, hit that back issue Bolo article on comicbookinvest.com. I touch on that. Um, Now's the time to buy that. But Donny Cates is killing it. This is an underserved series. This was a cool book. Cover A, I think, is the better looking book. And there was a lot, there was actually some good stuff going on in the guts of this book. A little bit of ego, a little bit of Galactus. Um, the book, the art. A lot of people don't like the Trad Moore art. I thought the art on this issue really harkened back to that like '90s um, Silver Surfer run where Thanos was really heavy into it. Some of that like real Technicolor. I, I thought. Tradmore may have found his footing on this series. I'm a Tradmore fan. I know some people don't like his style, but I'm a fan of his, and I think he, I think he did it with this issue. But this variant, I think most people were speculating that this one was going to do well, and we saw a lot of posts about it and discussion about it because people expected the duplication of what issue number two did, and you didn't get that. Um, this is selling for about fifteen, sixteen dollars, twenty dollars at the most. Obviously, that's under ratio. Obviously, if you pre-ordered this at ratio, you know, you're not making money on this. I don't know if you're really ever going to make money, if I'm being honest. Your best bet would probably be to lot up issue number one, issue number two, and issue number three and put them together. Um, so, you know, lesson learned, guys. And I'm not talking to, like, our people. I'm talking to everybody out there. Um, it's one of those things, like, you you, you got to be careful with that. Um, you got to be careful with just because this did well, automatically that do well. We see that with publishers. Brian's talked about that several times where there's certain publishers that get on fire, like Scout Comics got on fire for a while, and everybody was like, well, everything Scout is going to sell. It doesn't work out. Antarctic Press. Antarctic Press. That's your big one that you talk about. Um, Absolutely. Um, I I worry we may see that with SourcePoint Press, who I think is a great publisher, but people have started to, you know, every release has been $20. 
and all it's going to take is that one where everybody jacks up the order five times because they think it's going to be a $20 book and then it doesn't do it. And then everybody's like, oh, Source Point Press is garbage, which is just not the point. Again, read the comics. That's the point. If the reader buzz is there. The book will sell. Um, you know, and I think that's what happens. And, and I think that's what happened with this Marvel book. And it was interesting with this book because as soon as issue number two took off, you immediately saw retailers solicit the incentive variant for this book. They know what you guys are going to do. They know that you guys are going to sit and flip your number twos and make six, 45 to 60 bucks on a $20 purchase. So they know they can, they may have missed out a little bit on profit on that, but they'll get you on this one. They know what they're doing. So just be careful with that. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have multiple issues back to back, do money, but just because one does money doesn't mean that the other one, you know, this art doesn't match that Marcus Martin cover art. I'm not saying it's bad, but it's not great. I call this the, uh, the Aladdin diamond in the rough cover. <laughs> it's me of the cave of wonders. <laughs> yeah. See, there's Brian with those Disney references, baby. Yeah. He's a Disney Homer for sure. Yeah. But, um, yeah, moving into the variant buzz. This is surprising because we have a Zenoscope book in the variant buzz section. And we're talking about watcher number one. Yeah, I can't for the life of me tell whether I meant to put this in the variant buzz section because I didn't list a variant or if I meant this to be in the reader buzz section. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is the problem when you guys got me doing this list late at night on Tuesday and I'm trying to do the hot and cold show. And But yet the variant is doing worse than cover A. It's doing about half of what cover A is doing. There was a lot of talk about this book. Um, I'm not a big Zenoscope fan. Um, Brian likes them more than I do. Um, I, I tend to call them, you know, TNA books. And, uh, you know, they, they have their place and their purpose. But you got to notice, like, Zenoscope's had some hits when they've, when they've, like, deviated from that, like, pinup girl look. And they've actually, like, had some story. Uh, we saw that with... You know, that Illuminati book, uh, was it called The Code? And then they had like a series of like anthology series. Those did pretty well. Cover A here is doing about $14. These variants are doing about seven plus shipping. So it's still like $10, $11 shipped. Sets of A and B are doing pretty well, like around $25 to $30. So I just think it's a, there's a certain percentage of us, myself included, who tend to write Zenoscope off altogether. And maybe we shouldn't. Maybe, maybe, again, these trends work both ways. So you shouldn't assume that just because one book did well that the other book will do well. I got to stop assuming that because several books have done poorly that it's always going to be that way. Because if you look at the solicitation and the cover art for this, this is this is a, a interesting book, good-looking book. I don't know why this went completely beyond my radar. And, uh, and I, the funny thing is when people started really posting about this book, and I included it in the bullets. I wasn't even aware at the time that it was a Zenoscope book. That's how not in the realm of what Zenoscope usually does. And by the way, those if you ever go to a convention, you meet the Zenoscope people, great people. All the people who run their convention booths are awesome people. But um, yeah, it wasn't – this one caught me off guard. Uh, shout out to Andy Tomberlin from the Indie Spotlight series. He was all over this book. He saw this one coming. Um, and guys, if you're not reading the Indie Spotlight series, you want to know what's going on with Indie Comics – uh, pay attention to Indie Spotlight Series. Two of the best indie comics prognosticators out there are my man on the screen with me, Brian Wood with those Simpleman's Comics Weekly Picks. He's had his finger on the pulse of indie comics for as long as I can remember. And Andy Tomlin. These guys are great. And when they when they call out a book, they, they're right more often than they're not. And that's about all you can ask in speculation. But, uh, yeah, this one, this one, I have no problem saying this one missed me. And I wish I would have grabbed some cover A's. Yeah, the only question I have with this is, is, is this sustainable? Because I've seen a couple of Zenoscope books do this, yeah. but then within like a couple of weeks, I mean, they're right back down to where they were. And then the, even the follow-on issues, they don't sustain that value. So it's one of those ones where it's kind of get in and get out if you do it for speculation. Um, yeah, that's the lesson there. Yeah. Burn and turn, right? Right. And, I mean, I'm a Zenoscope fan. I've Shoot, I'm a Zenoscope VIP. I'm not scared to admit it. But... I'm doing that because I'm a huge fan of Paul Green, and they, Zenoscope has a lot of Paul Green covers, so I end up buying those, and then you get those VIP points, and then it's basically reward points, so you get more Paul Green goodness. But, yes. So it'll be interesting to see, can the Watchers sustain it? And 
will it, will it drop? But it's definitely gaining right now in the secondary market. Yeah, the the cool thing I like that Zenoscope does is those cosplay books. Some of those yeah. like Star Wars cosplay, and then at Heroes Con in the past they did a uh, a Carolina Panthers themed book. I had to grab that one. That those sports books yeah. they've done are pretty cool. Um, so they they know what they're doing. They know how to uh, appeal to a certain audience. Right, and yeah, like you mentioned, the Zenoscope booth always great people at com- comic conventions. So absolutely. And they always have the variant, their variant section there. So if you wanted to pick up some of those variant books and those cosplay variants, then they have deals on them a lot of times. So, but we're gonna move in through the variant buzz, and the last one in the variant buzz section this week we have Gwenpool Strikes Back, number one, one in fifty variant. Right, and now there are two one in fifty variants. Right. There was the Bacalo. Uh, I don't know if I'm saying yeah, Bacalo, Bacalo. Bacalo. I say it wrong, so. Yeah, I don't know how you say that, but um, it is what it is. Or Amanda Connor. Right. Now, there was a lot of speculation, and I, I'm not going to call anybody out by name, but, but even from some CBSI spec guys that I really respect, um, who were like, you know, I think this is going to be big money books because not many stores at this point are going to order 50 copies of Gwenpool. Here's why they were wrong. And because let's uh, spoiler alert, these books are going below ratio. They're going for 25 to 35. But here's why they're wrong. Because there's two 1 in 50 variants. When there's two 1 in 50 variants, they're really not 1 in 50 variants. Essentially, you can, even though they're two different books, they kind of cancel each other out. They essentially become 1 in 25 variants. For 50 copies, which for a retailer, if the book is, let's say, $4 cover price, right? The That's about a 200 two for buy 50 copies two dollars a book it's about a hundred dollar investment right for a hundred dollar investment on 50 copies i'm gonna get two one in 25 variants which brian mentioned to me before the show he likes that cover better than either yeah. of the one the lupacino cover was my favorite in these right lupacino does amazing amazing work so you're gonna get two lupacinos then you're gonna get the connor and you're going to get the Bacala. So if you're able to sell the two one in fifties for say $30 each, right? That's 60. If you're able to sell the, uh, one in 25s for say, even just $15 each, which is obviously well below ratio. That's 30. You're at 90. That means for 50 copies of this book, you're into it for $10. And all you got to do is have four or five pull list people, and boom, you're good right there. Now you made your money. And now you can put the rest on the shelf. Whatever sells, great. Whatever doesn't, dollar box those suckers and you made profit. And that's the thing is a lot of retailers, once they can kind of do that math, what, what, now some retailers aren't doing that math, no doubt. But we're seeing more and more as more of the old school, old guard LCSs tend to close. And we're seeing kind of the new school of LCS owners, more and more people are able to sit there, look at these ratio variants and go, well, this is an easy play for me because I can flip these variants and I can make this money. And, and, you know, I got a number one on the shelf and Gwenpool is popular with the Deadpool crowd. But I, I noticed that a lot, that a lot of Deadpool people buy Gwenpool um, in my boxes at, at conventions and at d- different shows. I, I tend to include Gwenpool books in with Deadpool and I see a lot of crossover. It seems like a lot of women who specifically who buy Deadpool will also buy Gwenpool. So, you know, I, I have no doubt that there's some of that that will go on, but yeah, from a speculation play, I would say as a general rule, when you see two books at the same ratio, they almost have no chance of hitting ratio. Another prime example of that was absolute carnage, a book I obviously absolutely love, but you know, you had Granoff and Delato one in 25s, both amazing covers but it's just it's, you're incentivizing the retailer too much, so you're going to get those over orders, and then you, the over orders don't affect the cover A oftentimes as much as it affects those individual incentives. So those the Delato and the Granoff were just everywhere. So they they because of that they went under ratio. They have a better chance than I think Gwenpool in the long run of sustaining value or gaining value, and they also have artists who are more synonymous with the secondary market for sure. But, you know, I, I definitely think that that isn't something I'll say as a just general rule of thumb to watch out for. Anytime 
you see two books at the same ratio, that means Marvel is really trying to go out there and sell those books. Whether it's I don't care if it's two one and one hundreds, if it's two one and fifties, if it's two one and twenty fives. As a general rule, when I see that, I go, eh. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay away from that from a speculation perspective. Great for the retailer, easy for the retailer to turn money on those books, or easier I'll say, but tougher for the secondary market speculator. Right. So that's gonna wrap up the variant buzz section. And real quick before we get into the long term play, want to make sure that we announce the winner tonight for the Slabbed Heroes Absolute Carnage Variant Pack. I'll bring that up on the screen again real quick as well. So we announced the winner for this pack that's on the screen, and the winner of that was Ryan Atkins with his comment. So, again, congratulations to Ryan. Make sure you email me your address at simplemanscomics at gmail.com. And before we get into the long-term play, Jack, is there anything else you wanted to bring up? I don't think so. I think I'm, I, I'm excited and ready to talk about this long-term play, but I will tell you what, I'm going to preface it before we get into it. I'm going to say, you were warned. Right. Trying to build anticipation. Didn't do you too know. good of a job of it, but we're just going to get into it. We got the long-term play coming up, and it's the one book, like last week, it's the one book that we haven't talked about yet, and Once and Future. And you knew that's where we were going, right, guys? You knew it. And normally, if you watch these uh, long-term plays, it's the AK, Mr. Bolo, long-term play of the week. And I go on my my whole rant. You know what? Not this week. Brian doesn't even know I'm doing this. I'm bringing Brian in on this one because <laughs> Brian deserves as much credit for this. Andy Tomberlin, shout out to you as well, my friend, because you know what? We talked about this book pre-FOC. We talked about this book in an interview with Arun Singh. We hammered this point home by cutting micro content. And Brian cut this excellent video that if you didn't want to sit and watch the whole Arun interview, which, again, by the way, guys, not enough of you watched. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, when you look at our hits on the channel, you guys are sleeping on these Indie Spotlight Series interviews. But you're getting spec gold, especially Arun. Arun is out here giving you. Bolo audibles. Bolo audibles, as he calls them, where he's taken, he's taken over. He's not waiting for me to bolo a book. He's straight telling you what you should buy. We talk about follow the money, right? I, I say that. How often do I say that, Brian? All the time? All the time. He's the VP of marketing. He's telling you where the money is coming from, where it's going. He told you guys, buy this book. He told you to buy this book before I was even familiar with what the hell this book was. When he originally brought this book up, it was just a name on a preview magazine to me. It, that's all it was. It wasn't anything that I sat there and was like, oh, man. The second he said that, because I respect him, and his place in the industry, this and who he is, and the fact that, by the way, guys, if pay attention to our Instagram this week, Brian Michael Bendis created a character yeah. based on him. <laughs> so obviously other people in the industry respect this guy. So the second he said, you know what? You need to be paying attention to this book. This is going to be a big book. And I know a lot of people may see that, oh, a salesman, right? Salesman tactic. But I know that's not what he's doing. He's in this thing for the long game. He ain't trying to take, he's trying to give. He gave information because he's a speculator. He's CBSI Nation. Right. He's Simpleman's Comics family. You know, he's not just some guy who's out there trying to sell books on the channel. Um, he didn't really care how many views yeah. that whole thing got. And the book kind of sold itself. I mean, who's the writer on the book? Right, Kieran, Kieran Gillen. Gillen. Right. What, book, what other book is Kieran Gillen writing right now that's gone to like 18th print for issue number one? And we're talking uh, about Die. Another book that we we hyped and told everybody to grab. Die. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this is a book, Once in Future. We, we let you know during the interview, right? We put that out. We put the interview out. Like a third of the people that watch, not even, maybe a fifth. I don't know that watch this show on a weekly basis, watch that interview. We weren't satisfied with that, were we, Brian? No, no. So so we cut the micro content, right? Cut now the micro people, content. And then more, what was the title of the micro content? Why you should pre-order Once in Future number one. Right, we, we're, we just we put it out there. Now, what you guys may not know, because you may not see behind the scenes of the speculation community, right? There's other speculation entities. There's other channels. There's other speculation... Facebook pages, um, you know, there's all kinds of people that, you know, talk about comics. You know what they don't like? 
they don't like pre FOC discussion, do they, Brad? Yeah, because you know we totally ruined the value on this book by putting this information out for FOC. I yeah, mean, this book yeah. is doing horrible right now, isn't it? No, yeah. I mean, just uh, all you can do, Brian, is double your money on cover A. I mean, immediately, maybe even triple by the time this video goes live. Um, all you can do is have a thank you variant that we let you know about in advance. Um, that we that totally was blew out the print run on this so much wow. so that we're going to fourth print. Fourth print. We told you guys the second print was going to be limited and that you better grab it pre-FOC. And it was gone like that. Um, same with the third print. We gave you guys cover art imaging on our Instagram. Again, people told us we should not talk about books pre-FOC because we're, what they're saying is that we're going to inflate the print run to the point that speculators can't make money. But here's the thing. First off, I've said this several times in this channel. We're not here to take from the community. We're here to give to the community. We're a part of the community. This, this is a symbiotic relationship between speculator, reseller, and collector. If we're just out here taking from the collector, right, then we're not, we're, we're not going to have an industry for us to do what we want to do. That's why I don't like the guy who buys 20 copies off the shelf at his LCS. Instead, what that guy should have done is pre-FOC, order those copies from his LCS, make his LCS some money, make sure that there were still copies on the shelf for everyone else who slept on this book, and he still got to make his money. That's what I did. I know that's what Brian did. We pre-ordered this book because we saw it coming. Why? Because, again, Arun told us. This is a guy who's as high up as it gets in a company, let us know, oh man, this book is gonna be big. This is gonna be a big one. Uh, again, and you have the name recognition of Karen Gilliam and just you know so, uh, a creator who's got heat behind them, coming off Die, still working with Die, obviously lots of option talk. And you know the way Hollywood works, right? When, when one property gets popular, they start looking at those other properties so Brian is even saying before show, I'm saying, man, I'm, I can't wait. I'm, this is a flip for me. Brian's sitting there like, oh, man, this is a long-term play for me. So, you know, here I am. I'm talking in the long-term play. And I was like, oh, man, I think I might flip some of these because I like the price. And, it, you know, Brian had to remind me like, oh, no, man, this is a long-term play. It's a great read. This was an exciting book to read. I enjoyed the first issue. Yeah, what we say uh, was like Indiana Jones meets Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. And it's in it, – it's a completely different book from Die, right? But it gave me that same kind of feeling of like, I don't know that this was a book that I would have grabbed initially, but man, I'm glad I did. I'm glad I did. This was a great read. Boom's on fire right now, by the way. Boom is putting out some serious hits. And uh, yeah, if you watch the, the Hot 10 show, the only Hot 10 show, there's lots of top 10s. Again, there's lots of top 10s out there, tons of top 10s. The only Hot 10 show is right here on the Simple Mints Comics YouTube show, channel. And we talked about that advanced retailer copy. That was the copy that got given out at San Diego Comic-Con. Boom wanted people to read this book. Why, why do publishers do that? They do that because they're confident that if you read this book, you're going to love it. If it was a garbage book, guys, they're not giving it out for free. Imagine if they would have given this book out for free. Everybody read it and was like, this is terrible. The book would have been dead on arrival. That's why this book sold out. That's why the print run got bought up it wasn't because me and brian talked about it i'm fairly confident not enough of you guys listen to us that's that's i'm pretty confident of that now the micro content video did better than the original video that we put out with arun and again you guys need to stop sleeping there's spec nuggets throughout each of arun's interviews that we didn't cut in micro content that you need to go back and check out um and at the same point, you know, we let you guys know this was going to be a hit. That thank you variant is one per store. If you watched Andy Tomberlin on the, of the Indie Spotlight series on last night's Hot and Cold show, he told you guys. He told you guys that, you know, or, or you know, this was one that was going to be doing numbers. Talk about a book doing $65. You know, this, this – it sold up the one copy at Midtown apparently for like $200. I think this is – the one per store variant is going to – escalate in price i think that the prices that it's going it started to drop a little bit only because most people who are getting them from their lcs they're flipping them yep because there's money to be made there so then so then the book drops a little bit but when this gets optioned notice i said when when this gets optioned what is going to happen to that cop that one 
the advanced retailer copy, again, another book where that prices keep rising on that one, don't they, Brian? Yeah, and I won't even say when it gets optioned. Those people putting them up on eBay right now, when those issues dry up, and issues two, yeah. three, four, and five, and that first art comes out and it starts building that storyline, and that story keeps getting better, without even the option news, the buzz for the book is going to increase the price for that thank you variant that's no longer available on eBay. Right, exactly. And that thing is, it, every one that gets purchased at this point on eBay, it's, it's just being taken off the market. Yep. It's being bought by somebody who's buying it to hold. So you're seeing the dwindling number of those books available. Um, yeah, Brian and I believe in talking about comic books pre-FOC. Why? Because the strength of our industry is built upon the ability for LCSs to make money. And in, we're talking about independent comics, guys. Marvel and DC, they don't need our help. They, they don't need us to sell their books pre-FOC. If you really go back and look at our history, Brian, have we really – I can't think of one Marvel or DC book we've ever talked about pre-FOC. We talk about indie books because they need that help. And we don't – we're not pumping for Boom. We're not pumping for Source Point Press or Mad Cave or anything else. When you hear us talk about a book, it's a book Brian and I either are genuinely interested in reading. We got an advanced copy and we read it and loved it. Or it's a book that one of us or both of us are sitting here going, this is a spec play. Yeah. And if you really think we're inflating the market that much, I want to say thank you for giving us that much credit because I don't you see know, it. I tell you, I tell you what, if you think we're inflating the market that much, I'm looking right at you in this camera. Arun Singh and Ross Ritchie, CEO of Boom, hire us. We need to have jobs then if we're the ones who sold this book. And then you're not giving these the great and talented team over at Boom Studios enough credit. Yeah. They don't, this is not on us. This is on them. The, the one thing we will take credit for is we gave our Simpleman's Comics family this information. We pass this information on to you. We say we are transparent. That is exactly what we are. If we believe in something, we're going to talk about it. Brian and I aren't always right. We're, we're, but I tell you what, we've been right pretty often with these independent comics releases lately. Uh, we, we told you about Canto. A lot of people laughed at us about Canto. We were absolutely right. Once in future, I think this got ignored a little bit. You know why I think it got no, ignored, Brad? I think because we, you know, we had a rune on twice. I think because we talked about Power Rangers. I think people looked at it and were like, "Ah, oh, those guys just like Boom." And Buffy and Angel. Right. So, but you know, but here's the thing, guys. If we were right about this, maybe we're right about Power Rangers. Maybe we're right about Buffy and Angel. Maybe you should be checking these series out. I think Boom is on fire right now. Um, we just talked about it last week, right? Uh, someone is killing the children. Yeah. Something is killing the, the children, yeah. Something's killing the children. Brian and I both read that book already. I think you're going to have another once in future on your hand. I kind of believe that. And you can either listen to us now and go ahead and secure your copies. Or you can miss out and be, you know, waiting on that third and fourth print or maybe maybe later print. FOC has passed on that, by the way. Yeah, yeah. So you can't kill us for that one. But I think we did put that information out early before yeah. FOC. You know, I, again, and as soon as we know about something, as soon as we believe on something in something, this is our platform, right? Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Yeah, we're CBSI. But this is our platform. This is where we get to talk about what we believe in. And we believed in these books. So we talk about them. And, uh, you know, they, it's great to see good books by good people doing well. And uh, the thank you variant or you know, the uh, uh, advanced copy was on the hot 10 list last week. I would not be surprised to see it or that thank you variant on the hot 10 this week. I don't write that list. I don't see that list till it's time to record. I don't see that list till way late in the night on Thursday night. So I have no ability to tell you what's on that list or I'm just prognosticating here based on what these sales are. This was the spec winner of the day. This was the one that everybody was trying to get. This was the one that we saw pictures the most being posted of either pickups, people being excited to see this book on the shelf. A lot of you LCS owners put this as like your spotlight pick, your pick of the week, your, you know, manager's pick. People were on this book. People saw it. This was one, don't sleep on these long-term plays. But like, kind of like Brian had to kind of get on me and remind me, hey, this one, don't burn and turn this one. Don't, 
why am I going to take a $4 book and flip it for 15 bucks and make 11 bucks and pay fees out of that when there's some long-term money to be made here? Now, if you've got that advanced retailer copy, you can make some money on that sucker. So I, I don't blame you if you're dropping that thing on eBay for like 170 which the last sale I saw on eBay was like 199 buy it now type deal. So, you know, if you're doing that, I can't, I can't fault you for that. But, right. you know, those cover A's, you might want to hold those ones long term. Yeah, because there's even stories of people reserving a copy of cover A, getting there, and the LCS owner going, my bad, I sold your shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, we hear about that every time a book gets hot, right? <clears throat> every time a book gets hot. You run into those issues, right? You run into those issues with LCSs. And Brian knows I'm not a big pull list fan because there's no contract between you and the retailer. There's no way for you to, like, for sure secure your copy. We saw that picture of the girl sitting there all sad with, you know, the the LCS employee with all of – or owner, I don't know actually who. I don't want to, like, disrespect her. But she had the stack of comics that weren't picked up. I sit there and go, that's that's the pull list situation. Unfortunately, there's no contract between retailer and customer. Either side can get screwed in that relationship. Right. So I'm a big advocate of pre-order. Put your pre-order in, pay your money, lock in your copies, uh, You know, make sure. You're also going to get the biggest discount that way. But yeah, I'll tell you this. We are going to continue to talk about books we believe in, whether it's pre-FOC, whether it's post-FOC, no matter what. Shout out to Karen Gilliam putting out another hit. Shout out to Arun Singh. And Dan Mora. And Dan Mora. Dan Mora, again. Dan Mora, who is Power Ranger artist, who has put out incredible Power Ranger variants, and who put out incredible artwork on this book. Shout out to Arun Singh, who Bolo audibled this book, hijacked this show to be like, we need to talk about this book. He was so excited. Shout out to him. I know he's pumped for these sales. And it's not over, guys. That second print is going to be a heater. Yeah, I'm just telling you that super, right now. Super allocated. Yes, super allocated. A lot of people. Have a, we've heard that a lot of people that have tried to get on top and order those second prints. Uh, Diamond was like, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, sorry, you're getting this many, and then the rest of yours is going to third print, which is now being pushed to fourth print." Right, tiny window. You had a very tiny window. You could not. What a lot of people do is they wait till this book comes out and they're like, "Okay." Now I see the heat on this book, so now I'll go run and grab that second print. Now nah, it's too late. If you didn't, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have to have a relationship with your LCS at this point to grab that second print. Third print, I think that's gonna be not as tough as the second print, but still very tough. Fourth print will probably be the print where you'll see the largest print run, not larger than say the first print, but maybe because that's the one that you know the readers are gonna get, the readers who want that copy. Um, but yeah, shout out to Arun Singh. Shout out to Ross Ritchie, Boom CEO. I know he's probably having a good day today seeing the success of this book. So, yeah, man, these guys these guys killed it. Um, this is a, this is a big one. Uh, was it something is killing the children? Yeah. Don't sleep on that. Don't. I get that. I keep calling it someone is killing the children. Yeah, that's James Tenney in the fourth, and we all know he's good at writing stories. Right, and he wrote a here for Boom years ago, The Woods. Yeah. If you haven't read The Woods, I love that series. Uh, that was one that was supposed to be optioned. I don't know whatever happened with that, but you know, James Tinney in the Fourth. It was like all those, all those books, like right? The Woods, The Trees. Yeah, <laughs> like all getting optioned around the same time. Yeah, around the same time, you get that Hollywood confusion going. But yeah, James Tinney in the Fourth, he he can do those dark stories. He can do th- that kind of stuff. Um, that book, I you know, I said I almost cursed when. Uh, you know, that book is messed up. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's going to be the next big boom book. And, uh, you know, booms, booms on a streak. So don't be surprised if you don't see Boom Studios create their own properties on the hot and cold list at some point in the near future. But this is this is a big – this is the long-term play of the week. I'm sorry Brian and I couldn't be humble about this one. We tried, We were humble about Camp Doe, weren't we, Brian? Yeah, and to be honest, I mean, this isn't, it's humble bragging, but I'm actually just excited for this book. I was excited yeah. for, you know, to, to hear about it, to talk about it, to try to put the information out for people as well. So there's no like, oh, you guys just hold information and buy this stuff up. No, we put the information right. out. We expressed our excitement for this book. We read it. We wanted other people to know about it and to see it be successful like this. Yeah, it gives you kind of a warm and fuzzy feeling. And that's what we're just happy to talk about it here tonight with the long term play. 
Exactly. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that we're pumping and dumping books because we're holding back information and talking about it post-FOC and tell us that we're ruining the market for speculators by talking about it pre-FOC. Nah, you're not going to be able to do that with us, guys. We are transparent. We are as genuine as we can be with you. And I'm telling you, you know, this was one we were just, we were right about. But it's not, again, it wasn't really us. I, we're, we're joking. A lot of this is joking, our bragging. Um, you know, this was, this was a rune. He said it. And I've been telling you guys to follow the money. He's the money. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you did, you made some money. Yeah. So I hope you guys, honestly, in all sincerity, I hope everyone in Simpleman's Comics family, CBSI Nation, I hope you guys watched some of our content and went out and bought this book, pre-ordered this book, and were able to make some money. I hope that this was a success for you guys. Um, and if it, it wasn't, don't take what we're saying negatively. But I hope that, again, when we get that kind of information directly from the source, that next time you'll take it more serious. And my man Andy Tomlin from Any Spotlight Series, watch his show right here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. We got more episodes planned. I don't, I don't know if we want to drop names, so we'll kind of keep that out for now. But we got, we got some big names coming and uh, some names of some, some popular titles, don't we, Brian? Yeah. So we definitely don't want to name them because usually that's when like Mar Murphy's Law happens and right <laughs> when people drop out and things like that. But we got some shows coming and there's going to be more speculation information. And I can guarantee you this: we're going to have a Rune Singh back on the channel. Yeah, we're going to do that. We can, uh, yeah, we can say that name. <laughs> we can say that when he's going to be back. He is, he is Simpleman's Comics family at this point. Yeah. And we're going to get Ross Ritchie on this channel eventually, the CEO of Boom. We've been talking about that with the room. We got to get Ross yes. Ritchie on this channel, so we got to go to the top man. But uh, that's that's we're gonna we're gonna make those happen for sure. Um, but yeah, you know, pay attention to that show. It's uh, it's it's. I know it's like an hour and a half, some of those episodes, so it's long. But you know, that's also we put out that audio version. Listen to the audio version. Listen while you're driving. Uh, listen to those episodes while you're bagging and boarding comics. Listen to them, you know, while you're. You know, doing whatever you're doing while you're cooking dinner. You know, that's the, that's why we put out those audio podcasts. We, you know, I know a lot of YouTube channels are starting to do that, but we've been doing that for a long time to give you that versatility. So again, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, those are available to you. I've said oftentimes to Brian that I think that the Indie Spotlight series is almost more effective in the audio version. It's it's. It sounds natural, so be sure to check that out. Be on the lookout for that, and be on the lookout for future indie spotlight series episodes because we got more heat coming. And you know, Brian and I, we love independent comics, and we're always going to show love to creators who are out here hustling and creating things from the ground up. It's easy to sell a Marvel and DC comic; those characters have folklore built in. It's a lot harder to take an independent comic from something nobody's ever heard of and have it be what we've seen these books like this book and dead end kids last week and you know series like that it's that's a lot tougher game so shout out to those creators who are able to do those things right so there we have the long-term play I want to thank everyone that's in the chat joe ran a little bit longer than normal but i think we had a great show tonight i also want to give a shout out to fredo i know you're in the chat right now so i want to give a shout out to you but tomorrow night premiering 9 p.m. Eastern, we will have the newest edition of the Hot 10 Comics, right, Jack? Absolutely. CBSI's official Hot 10 Comics show right here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel, coming from author Ben Stein from comicbookinvest.com. Like I said, lots of top 10s, you know, often imitated, never duplicated, but this is the Hot 10, and, you know, like Brian said, I know we ran long, but this is the key. The thing about the Hot 10 list is, it is the hottest comics, the fastest moving, the books that are flipping on the secondary market right now. There's a lot of top tens out there that are speculation tools. They, they come from different websites and apps and things like that, and the point of them is to show you what's trending. This is not what's trending. This is what's already popped. You should be selling the books on the hot ten. Yeah, sometimes they can go up, but you know, there's no point in making a YouTube video saying, oh, look at all the books that went down from the hot ten three months later because – you should already sold those books. You should have already made that money. That is the point of the Hot 10. And we hope you tune in with us tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern, Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel, where we're going to break out the next Hot 10. And 
two honorable mentions that almost made the list but didn't, including one Golden Age gem. Right. Yeah, definitely please don't go chasing those books that are on the hot tent unless you have a honey hole and you know they're sitting in a dollar bin box where you can go and yeah. snag them up real quick and sell them. But definitely don't go chasing them because you're buying high at that point, which totally defeats the purpose. Right. We talk about that all the time. Buy low, sell high. That's where the ROI is. Right. So I personally want to thank each and every one of you for watching tonight. Do us a favor. Click that thumbs up. And if you haven't, make sure you subscribe and hit that bell notification. So that way you're notified of all the new videos that are hitting Simple Man's Comic YouTube channel. Jack, last words before we go. Uh, thank you, everybody who's joining. We appreciate everybody who is in our live chat. We've seen our live chats growing. We appreciate all of our new subscribers. Shout out to Brian, who started this channel on his own from day one. Um, I, I, I'm his number two, I always say I'm, I'm Robin to his Batman, but just crossed 5,500 subscribers. I don't care how many subscribers other channels have. We're extremely proud of that number. We're building a community. We're building a family. We appreciate everybody who's rocking with us. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always humbled when I see those live audiences and how many people are watching and tuning into our shows live every week. Thank you very much. And, you know, we appreciate everybody in the Simpleman's Comics Patreon, Simpleman's Comics Discord. Thank you very much. Though, you know, our most loyal followers. And again, thank you for everybody who's who's new subscribing. And if you're new to subscribing, reach out. Let us know. We want to know you. Definitely. Really appreciate everyone. And with what Jack said. I'm going to say ditto, and we will see you guys tomorrow night, 9 p.m., in the live chat, premiering that Hot 10 Comics. Good night. Yo, 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 yo. Hey, coming in, yeah. Yo. Flex, I just want to win, yeah. LABB, who we running with, yeah. 2, 2, 3, 3, I'm on 10 again.